see, it's uh, it's about a little after 10 now, but I'm going to wait a few more minutes because uh, we've got, actually, we've got 51 people registered. There's 21 now. But uh, I think if, if if Lee is fine, we can start with at 1030 with him and we can chat about DNA or anything else that. Uh, yeah. With, yeah, with absolutely. Because there's can, 20, 22 people now. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I can, if you want, I can start talking about something from kind of not my presentation, but about the YDNA. I can show the new um, Discover More tool. Sure, sure. Okay, so this is my family tree DNA page. Um, you can see I've taken the YDNA, I've taken the lower level tests, right? And I've taken the big Y, so here's my big Y. I've taken the autosomal tests. Uh, family finder and I've taken the maternal line test and then here's my badges right for YDNA so what I wanted to show you is the discover more tool which is here um, so it's just a ton of tools for doing research so you have your haplogroup story which this is my family clade right so this is about a hundred year old family clade um, and the view I really like, I'm going to skip to it, is the time tree. If I come here and I find, remember that 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 um, I had mentioned I was going to talk about later about um, a grave site that they dug up? There it is. Yeah. yeah. And it tells you, well, we'll go in. This is how I'm able, this plus other things, I'm able to identify the tribe I came from. Um, but if I come and let me just, so this is me here. This is my dad. This is my family clade, right? And then this is my fifth great grandfather. And you can see it's using statistics. It doesn't know the paper. So I know the exact date of all of this. All of this, I know the dates because I have the genealogy, but the system doesn't know my genealogy, it just knows my genetics. So it's it's guessing, it's, it's well, it's not guessing, it's using statistics and giving me a range of when this person would have been born. Uh, so here's the dates and then here's the range, right? So again, this is me here this is my dad this is my like great grandfather my fifth great grandfather um this is nicolas de espinosa right that we're going to talk about today um and then ql 663 is that famous well, i won't say famous but well documented um half a group uh and then we can you just can go back in time right all the way back through time 6000 bc 7000 bc you know, 11th to 10,000 BC until you get, you know, like here's like the Americas, right? It's kind of like these are all the tribes wow. of Americas, right? And you keep going back to um, QM3. And now QM3 is super famous, right? This is the person that crossed the Beringia land bridge 15,000 years ago. 90% of all indigenous people of Meso and South America are descendants of this one man. I call this um, indigenous Adam because <laughs> this one man is the is the father of all, well, ninety percent of all um, men in in Meso and South America, um, and about seventy to eighty percent of all tribal men in the United States, and about sixty percent of all men in Canada. So again, I call this guy tribal um, tribal Adam, right? So this is uh, the time tree. Let me see. That's ancient an connection. Tool. And so this is just just um, another good one. Scientific details. So this is this tells me that my family clade. It doesn't know the genealogy. I know exactly. So it just get all it can do. It can give me statistics, right? Saying, hey, your family clade is born sometime between. You know, there's a a ninety five percent chance. That it was born between this man was born between 1824 and, and, and 1989. Um, and there's and so here's the mean 1929 is the mean. My grandfather was born in 1918. Pretty close, right? Pretty close. Um, so anyway, just there's just so many tools in here to use that have this has only been out for what six months, maybe seven months. Um, notable connections that show you all these famous people that will connect with your patrilineal line and how you, here's me, right? My, my family clade, and here's this guy, and here's how we connect. 
to a shared ancestor. A lot of it's kind of gee whiz stuff, but um, I love this one. Again, the ancient kingdom, these are all of the grave sites that they've, that they've found that connect with my line. See what I mean? And then, but the, it, it, this is the most important one because the farther you go this way, the farther back in time it goes right here. See that? This one's pretty close. Um, this is around what, 600 AD? That's not that long ago. I mean, for me. So anyway, so this is, um, I, I, I recommend that you come here. Um, the first place I usually go is to the time tree. Look for the red icon. The red icon is you. So if you find find the red icon and then click it, it'll put it into a view that, and then you can even, you know, then you can start going back and, and how far back you want to go. In this case, I'll go into genealogical time. So this is, if I go here, I'm outside of genealogical time. I'm now dealing with like DNA with bones that have been unearthed and stuff like that, but that's too far for me. So I want to go um, back here and then you can even change the view see that how you want to do it and this is important because tom when you want to um oh and by the way you can enter like um tom what what is your um what is your fam what's your family clade um my family clade is uh ft 237269 all right, it's going to make me try to log in. That's okay. Yeah, this is what the public sees when uh, they get on. All right, so let's go to the time tree. Here's the Martin Serrano line. Let me find the, remember I said find the red. So where's the, oh, there we the go. Top. So there, there's Tom. Okay, and then we want to go back to within genealogical time, which is this one. So 1500, right? Yeah, so this is the Martin Serrano line, and then you can, and then you can identify Tom because Tom will be the red guy right here. There's 27 men. Yep. So these are all these are all sons, right? Or or okay. So this is what we were talking about with Tom is that these folks right here aren't necessarily brothers, right? But they're they could be brothers, they could be first cousins, they could be second cousins, they could be third cousins, because uh, Y-DNA, uh, on average, only the mutation only happens on average every third generation. So it's not like you get a signal every generation, right? You can skip, yeah. and, and that's on average. You can go hundreds of years and not have a mutation occur. Or or the mutation can occur the next generation uh, in one, within one generation. So it's random. Um, it's random, but there's a pattern. So on average, like I said, every third generation, but there's a lot big range. So we don't know how these folks are related. We just know they're closely related. Probably, like I said, first they could be brothers, they could be first cousins, second cousins, or third cousins. So that gives us a little bit more information, but we would like to get the more testers you get. A lot, and then more, very important, what Tom and his folks are adding is the genealogy that goes with this, right? You lay right. the genealogy and then you're able to identify names and, and then we're able to talk about things like that. So anyway, so anyone can come in here, like I said, so it doesn't have to be mine. It could have been in this case, it's Martin's family. So you can see how much bigger um, his is than mine because that's common. And our HAPA group is a European-based HAPA group. will almost always be, you'll have more data than a Q, which is a QM3 type of, which is a native. A native um, HAPA groups are really hard to do because uh, the reason mine's as big as it is is because I've been investing in it, right? I've been driving it and recruiting and building it. A lot of people in the RHOP group, um, it's just easier. You have more people to recruit because there's just you're just bigger, right? It's from a family. So anyway, any questions on um, Discover More? Okay, I'll open it up to just general. I mean, we have about 10 minutes to burn. Are there any like why DNA questions or even general DNA, can mitochondrial DNA, autosomal DNA, any questions that anyone has? Lee, I do. Um, I noticed that you did an, a mitochondrial DNA for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is my Martinez is my uncle Rudy. He was the one that gave the sample. He's no longer with us, but I do have mitochondrial DNA for his mother, my mother, myself. Um, would it be beneficial at all 
to um, uh, order mtDNA for my uncle Rudy. I did just now upgrade to the big Y700 for him. So done. Took advantage of the sale. Your uncle Rudy's mother. Mm -hmm. Is that person represented already by one of these other mitochondrial DNA tests you took? My mother, her, um, my uncle Rudy's sister is my oh, mother. Yeah. And so, no, so you don't need another test. Okay. So, I, so, I did. Let me explain that. There's a big difference between Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. If you go back 50, 10 years, 15 years, okay, and you look at the Y DNA test back then, you remember, you guys remember or, or, or realize that the big Y700 didn't exist. The, the Y111 wasn't an option. The Y67 was an option. Y37 was like the um, most advanced thing you could do, right? And so what, what we have in Y DNA is that every couple of years, the same right place, right? Yes. mitochondrial DNA, it's the same test today that it was 15 years It's not growing. I mentioned that the Y DNA mutates on average every third generation. So that makes it very useful to be able to use for genealogy, right? Because it's like breadcrumbs. Mitochondrial DNA mutates on average every 700 years wow. on average. Uh, so it, it's it's not very useful for genealogy. Now, there'll be a couple of families that will say, well, wait a minute, we've used it big time for genealogy. Well, yeah, if you, just ha if you happen to be in a line with well-established genealogy that goes way back, there are some lines I can count maybe three in all of the New Mexico Genealogical Society DNA project. I can only think of maybe three, maybe four lines that actually got value from the mitochondrial DNA test. Everyone else is kind of like, it doesn't really, it's more it's interesting. Like B2A2 tells me it's Pueblo Indian. Okay, that's good to know. But then that's all it's really going to tell me. It's not really going to help me with genealogy. Um, and it's not, grow, it's not, there's no, it's not, grow, it's, again, it's the same test. It's never changed. Uh, well, I won't say never changed. It, it's 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 had one iteration where it got better. Where where actually there's three there was a, a um, three different levels of tests, but in the last 15 years it's basically the same test. Whereas every three years this test just it gets more and more, right? Uh, you know, give go give a few years and it'll be the Y uh, it'll be the big Y 1000, right? It'll be or it'll be like whole genome or something like that. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. We got like five minutes. Anyone else have any other questions? Yes, I have a question. I do not have it. I've done the the um, full mitochondrial, and mm -hmm. I did my cousins as well because she's on a different line. Mm -hmm. She has matches. I do not have a match. Oh, well. Here's the thing: is that let me show you what I mean by by that. Is that having matches really doesn't matter? It's, and and let me show you here why. Let me show you my matches. Um, well, I'll, I'll go, yeah, I'm supposed to show you the people's names. So I'm just going to go through and look. I just want you to look at the number of pages of matches. The problem is, I'm going to get off that really fast so that we're not sharing stuff. Um, the problem is with all those, I have hundreds of matches, but guess what? Um, my genealogy goes back about 300 years. <laughs> and I've found everyone else's genealogy that goes back that far. And none of us actually meet up. See what I mean? I guess even, though, even though they're a match. We don't meet up even at a at a at a um um to negative distance of zero. You have to go back four hundred years before those that those women to come together. So uh, that is why I have I should say I have thirty one matches, but I have no genetic distance. So that's why I don't have the yeah. genetic distance. Yeah, even and but even if you did, even if you had genetic distance of zero, meaning it's a close, it's it's there's no. Yeah. Even then, the probability, it's not zero, but the probability that you're going to find some genealogical helpful information is very rare. Like I said, I'd say 5% of testers can actually use it for genealogy purposes. The other 95%, it's just, it just mutates too slowly. But it's good to know. I encourage everyone to take, it's easier to take because um, if you're a woman, you have to, you have to um, recruit a person. But anyone can take the mitochondrial DNA test, right? A man can take it, a woman can take it, and once you take it, it represents all your lines, all your, all that all that line for that those women going back, um, for that one line. Um, okay. Any other questions? We got like three minutes. I don't have a question, but uh, I really would like to see FT DNA either get rid of genetic distance or explain it a bit more. 
because it really confuses people. I can explain it really well. The problem is I don't bother anymore. Earlier presentations, if you go watch my YouTube videos, I actually spent an hour talking about genetic distance and it's down. I have it down to a science. The problem is, is that it's useless. Now. Yeah. Yeah. We've moved beyond that. Now we have SNP, we have with a big Y, genetic distance is like an old, like it's, you know, it's like having an analog telephone and I have a cell phone. I mean, why would I use that analog telephone? I have a cell phone. So yeah. I'm not going to teach you how to dial with the, with the, you know, why I'll just press the, I'll press one button and it auto dials my wife, you know, number one, boom, you know? So don't even worry about genetic distance and spending all the time trying to understand it because it's just so such old technology. And it's funny because just three years ago, right. I was teaching people how to use it because it was the, it was the thing mm -hmm. so that shows you how quickly things are changing. Um, all right, I'm going to change my screen so I can go back to my main presentation here. As we're about to be on time to start the actual real presentation. All right, are we back? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, I was glad to get that out of my system. That was fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if I could, just for a moment, um, I'm Gloria. I'm the Gloria Gonzalez Cook. I'm the president of the GSHA Utah chapter. And um, I know uh, you've been doing something for a little bit. I appreciate it. Uh, but I would like to sort of officially introduce you and uh, to everybody. And so I'd like to have Manuel, if Manuel would come up and do the introduction. And So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Martinez. Uh, Lee, uh, Dr. Lee Martinez has been doing family history research since he was a child. Lee grew up in the Espanola Valley of northern New Mexico, and it, uh, and it helped that nearly all of his ancestors within ge uh, geological time were born, lived, and died within 35 miles of his home. As an adult, Lee was an early adopter of genetics genealogy and has become a recognized as an ex expert in Y-DNA research. Lee has provided consult Tate Consulting Services for the New Mexico Genealogical Society DNA Project and has proofread several of, his, of their DNA-related journal articles, and he's our cousin. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Okay, well, I wanted to um, wish everyone a happy Father's Day weekend. I think this topic is, is appropriate for Father's Day. Um, it's kind of the gift that only a man can give. <laughs> so let's celebrate the men, right, today. Um, I want to start by mentioning that we have two uh, types of trees, right? We have the, uh, uh, the family tree that our genealogy chart, pedigree chart that we're familiar with that includes everyone that we, that, that's ever, um, that we've ever descended from, right? And then we have a genetic family tree, and they're not the same. Um, as you can see here, as you go farther back, there's gaps in the genetic family tree um, that is not that that we have no information we'll never have information from. Um, so it can never really duplicate our pedigree chart. And the farther back you go, the more the white becomes until, and I'll show you another vis visual on this. So just understanding the the difference that we do have two trees. And what I'm all about is, Using both trees together, along with an understanding of history and taking advantage of any all branches of science to solve genealogical questions. And I'm gonna give you a case study on that today. But before I talk about Y-DNA, I wanna talk about its more popular uh, sibling, autosomal DNA, like Ancestry and uh, 23andMe and stuff like that. So you're like, oh, Lee, if you're such into genetic genealogy, why aren't you, you know, an expert in autosomal DNA? Uh, and my answer is, is that, you know, since really since I was very young, I already had my five generation chart done. And this is great if you're building a five generation chart. But if you're going back 200 years and farther back, this is totally useless for you. It's not going to help you at all. And here's why. OK, the fact of the matter is, is that most of your ancestors, remember that pedigree chart on the left that I showed you that wasn't the genetic one. Most of those folks don't give you any DNA. Right. So what you have here in blue is mostly autosomal DNA, 
And it, it, as you, it finally gets to the point, thanks, uh, as I demonstrated with our gummy bear friends here, that every generation, it cuts it in half, cuts it in half. And finally, after a couple hundred years, it's just so little of it that there's just nothing of real value left. The, so you're like, okay, what, are this, what is the stuff that does continue on? Well, this is all mitochondrial and Y-DNA lines. And, so, and, and then, like I said, of mitochondrial DNA and Y-DNA, Y-DNA is more useful for genealogy purposes. And so that's why I'm into Y-DNA, because Y-DNA is really the platinum tool for advanced genealogical um, research for folks who are look, working on your sixth generation and back. And the, and the um, case study I have today is way farther than 200 years. So we'll get into that here. All right, so Y-DNA is passed from father to son. Um, this is my dad and my son, and he now has three little boys. So the Y DNA lives on, um, and it goes from father to son. Now my father um, has four sons, so I'm just one of those. Hey, I told you I lost 13 pounds, right? I'm getting there. Living a healthy lifestyle, I had to give up sugar. Anyway, so he has four sons, okay? But one of those sons, me, had a mutation that did not, has never existed in human history, right? And that's, every time there's a mutation, that's the case. It's, it's, it's what a mutation is. It's something new. So now my son has inherited my mutation and he has inherited my mutation. And as long as boys are born for all, all time, 10,000 years from now, assuming that there's boys, that it doesn't daughter out and that there's boys, that mutation that I was born with will continue forever. And researchers hundreds of years from now will be able to identify my kids from my brother's kids based on that. And this is the conversation I'm having with Tom Martinez right now on the Martin Sedano line. That principle, given enough data, we're going to be able to tell eventually which son and grandson of the Martin Sedano line of Martin Sedano petrilineal person comes from because of that principle, right? Um, so as folks take a Y DNA test, it creates this Y DNA family tree of mankind that goes all the way back to Y chromosome Adam like 200,000 years ago. Um, I'll point out Q and R are very common Papa groups, but look how young they are. They're only like 20,000 years old, which in which is like nothing, right? You have some of these older ones that, I'll, that are, are, I'll point out like E, right? Look how old that is. We have some of these are like, you know, you have Neanderthals walking around back here. I mean, this is old stuff, right? Um, and so based on your HAPA group, you can write up right, right quick, tell you kind of what part of the country your patrilineal line is from. So here's an example how they've overlaid these, these HAPA groups uh, over on top of a map. Now, I tell people that this at this level, not very helpful for genealogy, right? This ancient stuff, not helpful for genealogy. The cool thing is that, especially in the last few years, why DNA has been some, come powerful enough. It used to be the, the DNA that was only for ancient stuff. And then it was for just like deep stuff. Well, now you can use Y DNA to identify a grandfather, right? It, it's all the way to the present now. Um, and so, for example, the Martin Sedano line would be an R1B line. Um, I think it's like 80% of all people, all men in Great Britain are an R1B line. That's pretty. 80%, right? And I think like something like 60 or 70% of all men in all of Western Europe are R1B. So it's, it's you know, there, there really is, um, these folks have been here for a long time and, they, and those sons have been born there for a long time. Um, so let's get into the genealogy because that's what we are, right? We're genealogists. Mm -hmm. So this is my, my paternal line uh, that I knew from paper. Um, and this is as far as I could go. It was Francisco Martin, who was born or, and, or, or lived in Chimayo in the early 18th century. And so I, I was, I was, there was no, there is to this day no paper that be, there's this, this, this paper thing right here. And oh, by the way, what happens in this generation, right, in history? This is the reconquest of New Mexico, right? Um, so this, this is the first generation born. Uh, uh, from the people who resettled New Mexico. So uh, in 1695, 1693, 1697, that time frame, right? Um, so a lot of people hit a wall right here, and I certainly did. And I wanted to know 
I wanted, of course, I wanted to get all the way back to Hernan Martin Serrano. That was my goal. So, um, I, as mentioned, I was born and raised in Española, which is between Santa Cruz and Hernandez. You may, there may be people on this call that have never been to New Mexico or, or you know, don't know New Mexico very well. So I just want to show you a sense of, of the topography I'm going to be talking about. So I was born and raised here, and I can track my patrilineal time backwards through time. So my grandfather um, and my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, they all were they all lived here in Yano Largo. And this is my connection with the Romero line, right? The Romero line is very closely related with the Martin, my Martinez line here in Yano Largo. Uh, this is by Penasco, and this is way up in the mountains. And I'll I'll show you some pictures. Uh, then, uh, uh, gender, um, my, my ancestor, my patrilineal ancestor was a first generation um, migrant. So the, when Yano Larco was first founded in, I think it was 1795 or something like that, he was he he migrated from Trampas to Yano Largo, and then we've been there ever since until World War II when we came down into the valley and there was a railroad track, right? So, okay, so where were they from before Trampas? Well, they were in Chimaya. And this makes sense. This is the narrative because if anyone that knows the Martin Serrano line story, um, right after reconquest, the descendants of Luis Martin Serrano went back to their original dwelling in Chimayo. Now there, back then, Chimayo was just a, a handful of farms, right? Um, and then, so you have the Santa Cruz Valley, so valley, foothills, mountains, right? So this is what Yano Largo looks like. See the beautiful mountain there? It's beautiful, right? It's beautiful up there. Um, Las Trampas, right? It, up in the mountains, it gets cold in the wintertime. Las Trampas, right? So here's my situation is I had this birth certificate for Joseph Juan Gualberto Martin, and I can see he's uh, from Trampas, right? And he's the son of Joseph Juan Gualberto Martin, resident of Las Trampas. So they're in Las Trampas. Then I have both a bond and a marriage record for Juan and Maria de los Reyes Chacon. And she's from, he's from Chimayo and she's from Trampas. So that explains why did they go from Chimayo to Trampas? Well, he went to, maybe her father had land, I don't know, but they ended up that. And then in their marriage records, I know, because of the marriage record and the bond, I know his parents are Francisco Martin, married to a Filippo Lucero. So the genealogical question is, who is Francisco Martin's father? That's what this whole case study is about. Who is his father? My, so the scientific method, right? I have a hypothesis. I know that in this time frame that this guy was born and lived in Chimayo, um, there weren't a lot of people. Chimayo was not a town. It was a village of, of a couple of farms. There are not a lot of people. And you guess who predominates? It's the Martin Serrano family that predominates in that in that area. Oh, and Luis Martin Serrano family. There's a son of Luis Martin Serrano, second name Francisco Martin, who's married to a Filipa. Case closed, right? Well, here's the problem is that the, from Mar Mar the Francisco Martin, that's a son of Luis Martin Serrano, who's married to a Filipa, is married to a Filipa Rivera. And my Felipa isn't a Rivera. So that gets a little bit more detail. So here are my documents, right? Here's the marriage bond. Here's the marriage record. And between all of this information, I'm able to tell all this stuff. And this is as far back as paper from my patrilineal line as I go. And yet, because of Y-DNA, I can go back hundreds and maybe even thousands of years farther back than this, okay? So let's talk about history because history is important. So this is the area and I've shown you, now you have a visual valley, foothills, deep mountains, right? So Don Diego de Vargas, this is the reconquest, right? So 1695, Don Diego de Vargas sent one of his lieutenants, Luis Granillo, to reconnoiter the Santa Cruz Valley in 1695, noting the presence of two farms in the Chimayo area. So the only thing of noteworthy in this date is there's two farms. I mean, that's not a lot, right? In the Chimayo area near the head of the valley. So head of the valley, that's where the water's coming from, right? Uh, he, remarked, he remarked on the Martinez Estancia at a distance of about half a league. So that's a mile and a half from the Tano Grant and the Captain Juan Ruiz farm on the boundary of the Tano lands. 
So Granillo recorded that the Martinez home consisted of standing walls only, so they're ruins, right, of the fan of the Martinez home that was there before the reconquest, right, during the 1680 revolt, right? Um, and there were only five families were so five Martin Serrano families. They're all living together in the ruins, and that these were Luis Martin, who had lived on their land prior to the revolt, and his married children. What a beautiful, wonderful document, right? It's like, like, wow, that's a lot of detail. And remember, it's the right place for my fam for my family line. And then I'm like, yeah, my based on history, my hypothesis is pretty strong. There is a petition for land in Chimayo written in 1706. So this is like, you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, which mentions many of the important figures and events that influenced the settlement of Chimayo, both pre and post revolt. This document contains a statement about the property of a Francisco Martin, a son of Luis Martin. So I'm like, awesome. I descend from a Francisco Martin. I have the paper. And here it's saying that there's a Francisco. I mean, there's not a lot of people in Chimayo. It's, it's, it's much bigger. It's not no longer two or three farms. There's probably dozens of or dozen families, but still, that's not a lot. So the only other record of a Martin Francisco Martin during this time, so other than this document, is this marriage of a Francisco Martin to Felipe Rivera. And so, but that's that. There's a problem there. It's like, wait a minute. If it had said Lucero, I would have been like, Pedro, I'm good. But no, I'm. I need some. I need some. I need to put my research into steroids here to get through this. So here are my investigatory questions. Are these two Francisco Martins the same person? In other words, or better yet, is Felipe Lucero and Felipe Rivera, notice the names are spelled differently, the same person? Is it possible, right? Um, who is the father of my Francisco Martin? And by my Francisco Martin, I mean the Francisco Martin that's the husband of Felipe Lucero and the father of Juan Martin. That's the Mar Francisco Martin I'm researching. So what's my hypothesis? Does the Y DNA support the hypothesis that my Francisco Martin is a patrilineal descent from Martin Serrano? So that's the question, okay? So remember I said that I couldn't use autosomal DNA because autosomal DNA can only help answer questions about 200 years back. And I'm trying to solve a problem 300 years back, right? So. I don't know why I keep coming back to this. Okay, so here are my results from five years five um, five years ago. First of all, notice my matches. Do you, do you see any Martinez's there? Do you see a pattern? Now look at the Hapa group. Remember what I told you? What was the Hapa group for the Martin Serrano line? It was R. And remember I showed you the map that R1B is like a very Western European, which is what you would expect from a soldier from Spain. Who here remembers what QM3 was, right? Well, it, maybe those of you who are here early got a preview. QM3 is the most popular common indigenous Native American line, okay? And, so, and then I'll just point out that a subclade of QM3 is, is QL663, and this will come in that later. So what have I just done through white DNA? Based on my investigatory question, what have I just done based on these results? Eliminated. I've eliminated my hypothesis. I Francisco Martin is not a, not a son of Luis Martin. <laughs> okay, and there's no doubt because it's not even from the same hemisphere. I mean, we couldn't be more farther apart, right? This is a my ancestor. My petrol line is not Spanish. It's Native American. QM three crossed the Beringia land bridge 15,000 years ago, and it is 60% of all native tribes in Canada are QM3 descendants. Like 70 to 80% of all natives of the United States are QM3, and 80 to 90%, or maybe even higher, of Mesoamerican South America men, indigenous men are QM3. So QM3 is the, by far, dominant half a group of, of native, of all native tribes throughout all the Americas. But again, that doesn't really help me with knowing that my patrilineal ancestor 15,000 across the bridge of the land bridge 15,000 years ago doesn't really, I mean, it's cool, but it's not going to tell me anything for genealogy, right? But white DNA fills the gaps between 15,000 years ago to the present, which is awesome. So here's QM3. I mean, it's, you know, it's here. Uh, linked to the indigenous peoples of the Americas, over 90% 
of the indigenous peoples that mess with South America today. Uh, such lineage is also includes blah, blah, blah. So, all right. So let's talk about, let me come back to here. So if you look at the earliest known ancestor and if you see a star before a name, it means that the New Mexico Genealogical Society has validated that line. It means that the, the expert researchers in the Genealogical Society have looked through your paper trail and say, boom, we agree with your research. So Nicolas, Nicolas, Nicolas. So well, who is this Nicolas de Spinoza, right? Because all these other Espinosas that aren't Nicolas are clearly descendants of Nicolas, right? So let's let's read the history and see how it lines up. So there are for some New Mexico history here. So if you remember the reconquest of New Mexico in, in 1695, 1697, it consisted of five different groups. And we learned this by reading we in the first couple pages of uh, origins of New Mexico families by uh, Fran Angelico Chavez. That right, he tells us about these five groups. Well, one of the, one of the groups are the original colonists, right? The Martin Serranos, the Archuletas, the you know those folks, right? Um, and then one of the other five is the Juan Pais Hurtado expedition. And so Nicolas de Espinosa joins that expedition in. Z which is gathering folks in Zacatecas, Mexico in 1695. So there's a muster roll that, it, that talks about, he's, he's giving information about himself. So it says he was a coyote by nation. Well, what does that mean? It means that back then, people, some people don't realize, but you know, I, I've been to India, right? I've, I've spent time there and in kind of have firsthand experience of the past system that exists there, right? Well, until relatively recently, Mexico had a caste system, and it was not as elaborate as the one in India, but it was quite elaborate. And a coyote back then wasn't a drug runner, right? Back then, it meant that you had one parent that was full native and one parent that was a mestizo or mestiza. Or to put it another way, you had three native grandparents and one European grandparent. That's what a coyote means. So that tells us about his genealogy right there, right? It tells us where he's from. He was a native of Los Lagos, which is now called Lagos de Moreno. I want you to remember that because this is going to be key when I start talking about how I can even go farther back and identify what tribe he's from. Okay. He's located, which is located in Jalisco, Mexico. He's 22 years old. So I know that he was born around 1673. And then he then comes to Santa Cruz. So if you, um, um, Jose uh, Antonio Esquivel, right, has this document that shows all the original settlers of Santa Cruz, year one, right, year one. And who's on that, must, who's on that role? Nicolas is. And so he's, he's there the first year that Santa Cruz is reopened for business following the reconquest. And we know how he got there. He came through this Juan Pais Hurtado expedition. So there's a notarized record from Santa Cruz, which I was like, I, I was born and raised about three year, three miles walking distance from Santa Cruz, right? Um, he claims to be the son of Jose Gomez and Maria de Espinosa. Well, that's interesting because Maria de Espinosa is a mestiza. She has a uh, father, uh, Francisco uh, Espinosa, who's Spanish, and a mother who's native. So, okay, that means that his father has to be full native. Because the mother isn't full native. The mother is half native, half Spanish, right? Now, the interesting thing is Jose Gomez isn't um, native. He's actually, the Gomez de Portugal line is a very famous family in that area. They're a founding family of, of that area. And they're a Portuguese Jewish family, okay? Living in Mexico. And what happened was, um, the Gomez de Portugal. Back then, if you were a high influential family and you were a founding family um, and you were a good Catholic, you were going to, I'm not Catholic, but my ancestors all were, right? So that's part of my culture, right? To be a good Catholic back then, you would adopt the native children and you would get them baptized and you would bring them into your home and you would raise them as Christian. Well, guess what? Yeah, um, it turns out that Nicolas is an adopted child, adopted son of, into the Gomez de Portugal line. So think about it. Why would Nicolas take the Espinosa family uh, as his surname? Any, any thoughts? And think about the culture of the time and think about the caste system. Because he's adopted? So he takes he's the adopted. mother's line? 
He has four grandparents. Three of them are native. One of them is Spanish. Who's that Spanish ancestor, grandparent? Francisco Espinosa. He picks the surname of the one Spanish person. Why That's would he do that? Nice. There's probably a reason, right? In a, in a time where- That moves him up in the caste system. Yep. So he's actually, he's in good shape. He's adopted <laughs> into a Portuguese Jewish family. And he has, but even though he doesn't have the bloodline, he does have one Spanish connection that's blood. And he's going to grab onto that. And keep that in mind, because this continues into New Mexico. He settles in Chimayo. So he's in Santa Cruz year one. Where is he year two? He's in Chimayo. And he lives there till the day he dies. So see how the YDNA, the YDNA tells me, hey, there's Luis Martin Serrano is not the, the, the father you're looking for. There's a man that you're missing. And he's native, and he's living in that little, I know there's no record, but I'm telling you, he's living in that little town, that little village. And sure enough, he's in Chimayo, right? So it's just awesome how all this, so I've solved this, I've solved this question. And, and I would ask, if you were to guess when this person would be born, I mean, when he would be born, I don't know his birthday. I only know he's his father because of the marriage, his marriage record. He, he, he couldn't be born before 1696 because he's a uh, native of, of um, Chimayo, and Chimayo didn't exist before 1695, before 1696. And, 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 um, and if he lived to be an old man before he had Juan, he'd be born maybe, at 1696, he'd be an old man if he was his father, but it's possible. And then if he was like a teenager, an old teenager, 19 years old or something like that, then you know, he'd be born as late as like 1720. And this guy here uh, lives, is having children in this time frame. The, his, his children are born between 16, the late 1690s and the early 1700s. So in other words, perfect. Okay. So my investigatory questions, are these two Francisco Martins one and the same? No. Who's the father of my Francisco Martin? It is uh, Nicolas de Espinosa, does YDNA support the hypothesis that my Francisco, um, or Francisco Martin is a bachelor of San Martin Sano? No. So see how awesome that was? And it wasn't hard, right? All I do is, uh, it took me five seconds uh, to look at the results. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess I have to, I have to go back and, and trim my tree, um, right? Um, okay, so then, you remember when I said, QL663 is a subclative of QM3. This is 15,000 years old. This is like, you know, a few thousand years old. So I go in, hey, let's just some, do some research on this family clade, right? This is awesome. So why chromosome diversity and Atlan descendants and its implications for the history of central Mexico? And they detect enormous paternal genetic diversity, including QL663. And later in this document, they attach, they don't, they tell me that the QL663 testers were from an Otomi tribal area. So the Otomi were um, lived in the Valley of Mexico before the Aztecs. And when the Aztecs came in, the Aztecs subjugated them. They're, they're one of the largest groups in Mexico, but they're not very well known because they were not, they're always a vassal state. They're, they were never like, in, they're never the Maya or the, you know, um, th th their language was not Uto Aztecan, right? Uh, Uto Aztecan came from the north and didn't come until relatively recent times when the Aztecs, people don't, so a lot of people don't realize the Aztecs were not from Mexico, right? They were from, well, we don't know where they were from, but they could have been from as north as, as the American Southwest or as south as like northern Mexico, but they were not from Mexico, the Valley of Mexico. They came in from the north came into it and within a few generations basically took over and then they then there were the Aztecs and they were in their growth mode when the Spanish came. So they were just on the cusp of just really exploding out just as the, as the Spanish come in, right? So the so now I have a tribal affiliation with QL663. It's just one piece of data. Then I go and look at my Y-DNA results a little bit uh, deeper. There's a part of your Y-DNA results called the discover more tool, which I, I demoed uh, for those who showed early, I've already demoed it. And there's this, so what it is, is these are burial sites that they pull bones from places like this, 
this is the real place, by the way. And they come out with, this is Kanyada, this man, Kanyada E8. This is a person, it's a human being, right? It's a, a skeleton. He lived between 540 and 660 C of the common era. So 540 to 660 AD during the ceramic age and was found in the region now known as Cañada de la Virgen Guanajuato, Mexico. So this is that place, okay? And here's my family clade. And here is that burial. And here is our common shared ancestor. Here's the cool thing is that when I went in to look at, at this burial site, they are a Otomi archeological site. So remember my QL663, which is closer to me, QL663 is like about right here. And it was associated with Tester Shore for Otomi. This was found at an Otomi site. See that? So then I went into chat GPT because I'm a modern person. And I want to use uh, AI. And I say, tell me about the language that would be spoken by the Ottoman folks. And they're like, yeah, the Ottoman language family is the one of the largest uh, language families. It's not, it's different from the Uto Aztec and it's more similar to the language. Another, a more popular Uto uh, Otomanguin language would be the, well, this escapes me, but there was a, the Toltecs, right? The Toltecs, they spoke uh, Otomanguin language. And, and the, uh, um, and they said that it's several branches, and one of those branches is the Otopamian branch, with, to which the Otomi language belongs. So the Otomi, this is their language, which is a part of this language family. So now I know the language that this that my patrilineal ancestors found. Now watch how I connect this back to back to what we know about Nicholas de Spinoza. He was a coyote by nation. And we know we know be through gene DNA that of his four great of his four grandparents, his patrilineal grandparent is native, right? Because he's Q. He was a native of Los Lagos. That's important. Let me show you what that means. Remember that I said that the Gomez de Portugal family was this founding family of this area, and that this actually comes from a book written in Spanish about that. The whole book is just about that family. And what this shows is this shows all the native tribes around the area and, and matrilineal, um, the different genealogical groups of the Gomez de Portugal line, who those families married. Okay. See this, um, the, this is where Nicolas de Spinoza is from. These all speak all kinds of different languages, right? These are, this is, this is what we call um, the Chichimec Indian Confederation, right? These are Chichimecs. They're not one tribe. They're a confederation of tribes that have shared culture, right? I want to call your attention to this one area. What's special about this one area? They speak the Otopamian branch. They, they are ultimately speaking language family. So now I have a new hypothesis. Nicolás de Spinoza, who's living in, who's, who's adopted, I don't know where he was born, but he's living with a family in Lagos. His, his patrilineal line is tied to the, an Otomi tribe, and there happens to be an Otomi tribe with a patrilineal family connection to that family he was adopted to in that tribe. So now I have a possible location of where his tribal family is from. How amazing is that? You know how hard it is to find a tribal affiliation for even if you have QM3? Here is the Joseph Gomez and Maria de, de Espinosa marriage. So it just it just shows the the Gomez de Portugal line, um, and he and yeah he and the what happened is that the Gomez de Portugal family married most of the women in the area are native or native descended. There's mis for every one I mean there's um, there's nobody but even in this state there's very few Spanish or Portuguese women walking around. They're all mestizas by this point. They're so mixed. So that ends my presentation, and I will open it up for questions. Um, I guess if I could just summarize is that Y-DNA is just a power tool, unparalleled power tool to find things out beyond five generations of your genealogy. So if you've mastered your five genealogy, five generations, and, you're, and you have brick walls, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, Lee, this is just one line, and I have 
dozens, hundreds of lines. Well, here's the deal. 50% of all those lines are patrilineal lines. So if you're like, if you say you have 30 lines that you're stuck at, well, probably about 15 of those you can use Y-DNA for. So for example, yeah, I've done, I've just shown you one case study. This is my, um, my dad's dad's line, but I also have a similar study for my dad's mom's dad line and for my mom's dad's line and for my mom's mom's dad line. So for example, um, my dad's mom is a Sanchez from um, the Española Valley. And there's two different Sanchezes. There's one Sanchez that descend from, neither one of those Sanchezes descend from a Sanchez, by the way. If you go back to the early 1800s, the Sanchez surname disappears and none of those folks descend from Sanchez. One line descends from, it's thought that they descend from a Catholic priest with the last name of Munoz, but that's not my Sanchez line. My Sanchez line goes someplace else. It's look the I'm actually in the middle of I'm working with um, the New Mexico Genealogical Society on my current hypothesis. My current hypothesis is that my Sanchez line is a patrilineal descendant of Asensio de Archuleta. Yep. If you look at my if you look at my matches, four of them are Archuletas. One of those Archuleta. Um, and oh by the way, we have yet to find a true Archuleta line that's validated. In other words. You can't show me a person who has a genealogy that goes back to a sensory Archuleta that's also validated by DNA, doesn't exist. We have yet to find, all, every time we find an Archuleta, it ends up being a native line with the Archuleta surname. Or if you go back far enough, the Archuleta surname, there's no evidence that actually descends from a sensory de Archuleta. And so where's the Archuleta? And it turns out that a sensory de Archuleta's patrilineal line may be amongst us. We just don't know it because it's not going by the surname Archuleta. Which is funny because my mom is uh, maiden name is Archuleta, but her, which is another one of my line lines I'm studying, patrilineal lines to Y DNA. But I already did the Y DNA test, and that Archuleta line, like most Archuleta lines, descends from a Pueblo Indian male. The only line that I have so far that I've tested that actually matches what you would expect is my Trujillo line. My um, grand, my maternal grandmother is a Trujillo, and yep, sure enough, that Trujillo, her father. Um, Trujillo descends from the original Trujillo. So I have, at least I got one, right, that 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 doesn't take a, a detour on me. All right, so so half of all your problems can be solved by Y-DNA. No matter how many problems you have, probability is 50% of them can be solved with a Y-DNA test. All right, so questions. And I've filled in a ton of um, questions for those early people that showed up and we sh showed some other tools and stuff. Um, Manuel has a, a question. Yeah. I don't know. This, can, I don't know if you can hear him say this. Okay, basically, so uh, your um, uh, great grandmother on the, was it Madrid? How have you followed that line back? The Madrid side, because it seems to be pretty consistent with the very beginning of New Mexico history or New Mexico settlements. Have you, yeah. uh, what have you found out about that one? Yeah, let me show you. Um, let me unshare and share. I need to show you something else here. All right, where did I find that? Um, uh, my great grandfather was actually adopted by the Madrids, and why he didn't take the Madrid surname, I don't know. He didn't, but he was he was raised from birth with the Madrid family. Um, and what and so what happens is that we descend both. So my paternal grandparents are actually, my, my grandfather and grandmother are actually second cousins once removed to each other. And why they're second cousins once removed to each other is because they both descend from the Madrid family, same Madrid man. Um, if I can just find it, sorry. Oh, oh, here we go. All right, so I need to turn this around. Oops. All right, this is kind of, oh, so I'm gonna share my screen here, share. Okay. All right. Can you see this? So this is me. Okay. Uh, this is John Martinez, my uncle, that you probably know. My dad. This is my grandfather. And this is my and his wife. And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother's mother was Maria Madrid. Okay. My her husband, Modesto, 
His father is Juan Bautista Martinez, and his mother is a Madrid. And Jose Antonio Madrid is the ancestor of both lines. So these are siblings, right? First cousins, second cousins, second cousins once removed. See that? So now here are my third cousin Martinez's. So this is uh, Patrick Martinez. That's a, the, the uh, pharmacist there in Yanolarco area. And then there's another Martinez that's actually living in, in Utah. Um, and um, yeah, this is the this is the one. This is Patrick, and this is uh, the other guy. And Patrick is the grandson of Ovedo, and the guy that lives in Utah is the grandson of Roger. And they're both sons of Elias. Elias Martinez, I believe, if I'm not misunderstanding, is is married to a Romero. And so that's where the Romero line kind of fits in there also. Um, does this help a little bit, kind of showing where the Madrid line fits in with my line? So when my, when my Juan, so these are brothers. And Juan Bautista is a year older than Elias. Elias got to stick, stay with his family. Juan Bautista never lived or was raised by these folks. He was, he was raised by... Um, I don't know a, a Madrid family. I'm not sure which one. So someone somewhere in here, he was he was he was given as an infant over to the Madrids and raised in Madrid, but he kept the Martinez name. I don't know why. Um, so this is uh, Juan Jose Alberto Martin of Las Trampas. Remember him? And then he was born in uh, 1767. And then when he was a young man, the um, colony had extended out deeper into the mountains and founded a new town called Llano Largo. And so, so he's in 18, in the early 1800s, he's one of the first settlers of Llano Largo. He has two sons, and this is important to note, Cayetano carries his last name. But wait a minute, why is this guy a Lovato? If I look at this guy's, I've looked at these guys' genealogy, and they say that Vicente Marcelino Lovato is a son of, I can't remember, Mr. Lovato, but he's not. So to this day, Mr. Lovato right here might not know that Mrs. Lovato, when he was out tending sheep, Juan Jose Alberto Martin paid Mrs. Lovato a visit. And the priest who signed that baptismal record may not know. As a matter of fact, to this, if I were to go back in a time machine, and I was just hanging out with these folks, with the priest, with the family. The only person besides me that would know that Vicente was actually his son would be Mrs. Lovato and me. How is it that I know something that the folks in that day don't didn't know? Well, the power of DNA. And so to this day, the Lovato family of Viano Largo are actually Martinez's. So get this. That means that this is a Martinez who married a Martinez. So again, brothers, right? First cousins, right? Second cousins, right? Second cousins once removed. Again, just like my grandparents are second cousins once removed, their parents are second cousins once removed. And this is not unusual for a little teeny uh, village in the deep in the mountains of Llano Largo who, who have been there for hundreds of years. I mean, how many people are there to marry, right? Anyway, does that answer your yeah. question on the Madrids? Yes. Okay, cool. Any, any, other questions? any other questions? And I can answer autosomal and mitochondrial DNA, any kind of DNA questions you might have, anything. I'm more, I know more about white DNA, but I know a lot about the others as well. Uh, Joe, Joe Sanchez uh, had did a little chat and he said he'd love to chat about the Sanchez de Inigo line sometime. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's that had... other, that other, I think that's a J Hapa group. If I recall, um, hang on. Let's see if I can bring it up. I don't know how much time do we have left. Oh, you have uh, about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, set. so let's 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 do that. Let's look at that line. Okay, so I'll just simply say that the 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 Sanchez line um, that he is referring to is actually well researched, right? There's there's meaning that there's two folks, there's two people who have a who have a good paper trail. All the way back to 
that sunk to an ego line. True. And they've both taken the white DNA test, which is why I know that my sunk line isn't affiliated with their sunk line. Although my sunk line married their sunk line. So, of course, remember, I say I'm not a patrilineal descendant of Hernan Martin Serrano, but of course I do descend from Hernan Martin Serrano. Everybody does, right? So I actually have a Sanchez that married. I have a Sanchez, I'll call it law. For now, I'll call it the Sanchez Archuleta line that married the Sancho, that married a woman that is of the Sanchez Inigo line. And so we actually do descend from both Sanchez lines because they're they're both, they married Sanchez, married to Sanchez. But that line uh, is, we, is a, I believe, a J Hapa group, which if you remember, um, can you guys see my screen? Um, what do you see? You. Oh. Oh, I'm going to see Your what you QF see. QFFT5172. All right, so I'm going to unshare and share so I can show you, show you a different view here. Uh, share. Okay, so remember this map. So I say the Sanchez to Inigo line is a J Hapa group. So that means that, see where a J Hapa group is? Uh -huh. yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, so, that's, so yeah, so reach out to, you can send me an email, um, you can text me or whatever. There's a lot of information um, and it's really well done. And we have two good, um, um, you, ha you're, you actually have better genealogy than my son's just line. Um, and we've had a lot of good people take the, maybe you're one of them, have taken the Y DNA test and, and so we know that half group. Um, and again, so, so you have, if you were to go to New Mexico or to my hometown, oh, Martinez, I'm a Martinez. Well, it turns out that, and Tom will tell you, most of the testers that actually test for their Martinez and online are not Martinez surnamed people, right? Very few of the people who are have tested and are, are affiliated with the Martinez and online through DNA are have a surname that's not Martinez. And so, uh, and and a lot of, of Martinez's that most of the Martinez's that have taken DNA tests have ended up not being Martinez. So having the last name Martinez means nothing as far as proof that you're a descendant around Martinez and I was just random. Uh, you have a higher probability if you have a last name Martinez of not being a Martinez and I descendant than a, a, a different <laughs> surname. So it's really weird. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the way surnames were. So remember, I just want to get back to um, Nicolas de Spinoza for a second. Remember that his son, my ancestor, is Francisco Martin. Well, wait a minute. Why would he not? Why is he not Francisco Espinosa? Well, one, it's a good probability because I know for a fact that Nicolas was married. And oh, by the way, Nicolas has lots of descendants that were not from his wife. So he got around. Um, but think about it. If you're, um, if you got pregnant by a Martin Serrano person in Chimayo in the early 1800s, and that's the family that dominates the politics of the area, um, would you, there are no Espinosas in that village other than Nicolas, and Nicolas is some coyote from Mexico, right? And then you have this Martin Serrano line that like, we're the original settlers. We're, you know, we were here from back and we're 10 times bigger than you. What surname would you give your son, right? If you're in that, if you're a Martin Serrano woman that got pregnant by uh, Nicolas de Espinosa, are you gonna give him the Espinosa name or are you giving him the Martin Serrano surname? So a lot of what we see back then, just like Nicolas de Espinosa got the Espinosa name, even though his, uh, adopted father, adopted father was a Gomez. He took us, he took the name, or he has the name that helped him best navigate within the social structure that existed at the time. So we, as modern 21st century people, need to remember that they thought differently, they handled surnames differently, and they had social, political, cultural dynamics that we can't begin to understand because it was a different world, right? And so we think that, you know, now there's no question when my son was born, what his surname would be. And it's no surprise to anybody that all my three of my grandsons are Martinez. But that wasn't the case back then. I'm surprised that my great grandfather wasn't a Madrid. That shocks me. I'm still trying to figure out if you're if you're a Madrid family, you're going to take your your uh, baby primo and um, 
take him as your own, why wouldn't he? There had to be a reason, right, that they kept the surname. And maybe there was an agreement. I don't know. But the fact of giving a child, and why would they give a child away? And by and then a year later, then they kept Elias. Why would they keep Elias but give? Um, maybe, you know, they weren't back then. I mean, the, the poverty, right? Ayano Largo, that's a that's a rough place back then when if if you had a drought, you were in big trouble, right? So it was very common in 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 not so far distant past that a child, an infant would be passed to a relative to be raised forever and just given, sometimes not even legally adopted, just given because I can't, I can't feed this child. And that happened all the time. So then surnames are all get all mixed up. And this is all the more reason for why white DNA is important. We, people who are from the Amer that have this Latino Hispanic background from these migrations that came with uh, Oñate, with the Vargas, with, you know, that most of us um, come from, I'm assuming, many of us, um, um, you're going to find that the surnames were very unstable. And as evidenced by the fact that most Martinez's end up not getting a Martin Serrano Hapa group. And most people that get a Martin Serrano Hapa group aren't Martinez's, right? Tom is, a, is an exception, right? Surrounded by all these non-Martinez testers. Um, okay, any other questions? We had a couple of chat questions. Let me see if I can um, get them on here again. Whoops. I had a question sure. when you're done too. This is Mary Lou Duran. Oh, go ahead. Oh, is there an actual DNA sequence for now, Martin Sedano is a question. Yes, and Tom Martinez is, um, mentioned earlier that he's actually writing a journal article that's gonna be published and it's gonna be amazing because I've seen the data. And it's one of the, probably the most well-researched surnames in all of the South of, of Hispanic Southwest surnames. I mean, it's well done. There's the, so yes, there's an actual DNA sequence for Aaron Martin Sano. Now, we remember, let me, let me put a caveat, that, that the mutation only happens on average every third generation. So I don't, we don't know whether that mutation is Hernan Martin Serrano or his son or his grandson, or maybe Martin, Hernan Martin Serrano's father. We don't know because it's not impossible for, let's say that first, whoever that first person was that came into Mexico. I don't, I'm not even sure what that person's name is. I'll call him the father of Hernan Martin Serrano the first. It's very possible that he had a mutation and there was no other mutations for four or five generations. And then bam, all of a sudden, Luis Martin Serrano the first, or maybe even the second has a mutation. And between them, between the, those five generations, there's no way to differentiate them with DNA because DNA, as we are able to um, test it in 2023, only occurs as every third generation on average, but it can go hundreds of years. So. No, we don't have a DNA um, that says, "Oh, this this ha this ha this mutation is Hernan, Hernan Martin Serrano." It could be, it might be, but it also might be his son, his grandson, or his father, right? But we know that based on statistics, it's it's within that generation, right? So, and Tom will get into that, I'm sure, in more detail in his paper, and he's trying to tease these things out. So, more to come. Um, let's see. Any comments on CZ456391 Hapa group? Um, okay, let me unshare my screen and share my screen. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look up, hang on, where's that? I'm gonna ask you to tell me that Hapa group here in a minute so I can type it in. Um, so let's go to discover more. Okay, so you said it was C, and then what was the rest of it? It's CZ, um, CZ 45639. Let's see what we did here. All right, so um, this was formed uh, from this higher group here around 2,350 years. BCE, so before the Common Era, or 2350 BC. So see how ancient that is? So here's the thing that I'm glad you brought that up. So when you take a DNA test, 
So have you taken the big Y test? Uh, yes, this was for my father. Got it. Okay. So what happens is that the thing about the Y DNA test that makes it hard is the cost. It's expensive, right? And to make it worse, you need, it's a team sport. You need multiple, I call it the, have you ever heard of the term, the rule of four? Yeah, I have. Okay. And so, but if you could explain it again, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. So what you have is that you need the rule of four. And, and this is something I espouse and I got it from the rule of three, which comes from the guy named Bill Wood. He has this rule of three and I expanded it and call it the rule of four and I've written a paper on it. So what it is, is that the rule of four says that in order to create a family clade, in other words, in order to have, a, um, like I have a family clade, right? In order to have a family clade within genealogical time, my family clade, by the way, is uh, 55 years old. How do I know that? Because I'm 55. Remember I said I had a mutation? That means I'm a father of a, of a family clade, right? And because I've tested, okay, so I have so I have a family clade that's 55 years old. That's a subclade of a family clade that's 100 years old. That's, that's the um, descendant of another family clade that's about 300 years old. That's, uh, so, so I have a ton of family clades that are within genealogical time. That's because I followed the rule of four. So, for example, you had your father test. So if you had your, let's go to the time tree. So you have this big gulf, right? And so here's interesting. Someone's, um, some testers identify themselves as native. I see, I don't, let's look at the country frequency here. United States, migration map. All right, so this is a native. Wow, this is interesting. This is a native line. I've yes, never, it is. This is very. This is rare. Is this rare? It is rare. Yeah, is I've rare. never heard of a C. If you remember, I, mean, I'm I, could, still, I, I represent to 90, 90, 80 to ninety percent. This is like maybe like two percent. This is very. This is very awesome. So this is a, a, a like a Canadian. Remember when I said that QM three is like ninety percent here. It's like 80% here and it's only like 60% here. So the farther south you go, the more prevalent QM3 is and the farther north, the less. Well, this is interesting. It seems to indicate that this is a Canadian tribe. I know it has some French names on his, um, you know, in the matches. So what you need to do next step is you need to get a close relative of him, of your father. It could be a son, it could be a brother, it could be an uncle, it could be a first, second, or even third cousin. But okay. the closer, the better to test. And what will that will do is that will, there's all these unknown mutations and it will that, that just shows up as unknown. And instead of being unknown, we want to name them and get them on a database. And so that's what that will happen is as a, that close relative takes a test, it will name all those variants. Then it becomes like a giant fishnet. Anyone that's a match of you will start to get caught in this net. Then the next thing you want to do, this that was the rule of two, the rule of three. So the rule of one is take the test. Then the second rule is very close relative of the person that took the test, uh, male takes the test. Then the third thing is you want to find a fourth cousin, that's, which is hard to do. You have to have a really good genealogy to do this. A fourth cousin, ideally, a third cousin, if, if, if that's all you got, a uh, fifth cousin, a fourth cousin is like the sweet spot to take the white DNA test. And that will create a family clade um, for you. Okay. And then the rule of four, the fourth rule is then you start working your way farther, but you try to find matches, which you probably have very few because it's so rare. But you want to try find, you want to find anyone that matches you that's way beyond that fourth cousin. Um, and you want to encourage them to test and start filling out the blanks. So that's the rule of four. And you have to build you're a pioneer. You have, you're going to have to build. You're unlike the Martin Sedano line, right? Which is the opposite of this, right? They get to inherit this well-established. You don't get to do that. You have to build yours. I built mine. This is what mine looked like when I started, and mine is pretty well designed now. It's not as big as others, but it's pretty well. Well, there's a lot of good. And now, now, you, well, you saw, right? I'm learning a ton of stuff, but uh, only because I recruited people and and did all that. So that's does that help? Yes, it does. It does okay. very much. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Any other questions? Somebody was asking if you could explain the Y700. 
Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to, so there's actually two different DNA tests. The y, big Y700 is not an upgrade. It comes across and is marketed as an upgrade, but it's not, which means it's actually a pretty good value, even though it's expensive. It's a completely different chemistry, the science different. So the, the big Y, the Y12, Y25, 20, 37, 67, and Y11, one one eleven, are uh, are stir tests. So what's a stir test? Think of a stutter. Actually, I have a. Do we? If we have time, I have a PowerPoint for that. <laughs> um, hang on, I'm going to unshare. Um, how do I unshare? Am I sharing right now? Yes. Yes. I am. Sorry. Okay. So how do I unshare? Um, it says new share. Stop share. Okay. Um, hang on. Um, stop share, and then I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my other. I I had two different presentations I was going to give you guys, and I had to pick which one. It was rough for me, but some of your questions are leading to this. So, I uh, so thank you for that question because it gives me an excuse to use my other PowerPoint. Um, all right, so share screen, and I want to share this. All right, so this is a so you do you see this um, G T A C T A? You see that? It's oh, not up. We, share it no. we only see you. Do you see it now? Uh, yes. yes. Awesome. So see how it's like a stutter. Uh, these are these are lines of of genetic code on your DNA, right? So the G, P A C T A G, and then all of a sudden there's C T A C T A C T A C T A C T A. This is called a short tandem repeat. It's like a stutter, and that is what the Y thirty seven, the Y sixty seven, and the Y one eleven are looking for. So remember, we're talking about genetic distance. If I did a Y37 test and you did a Y37 test and we were one genetic distance from each other, that means that along those 37 different lines, one of those lines, there was a one step difference. See that? I might have this and you might have that. All the other 36 lines of code are exactly the same, but one of our lines of those 37 I'm off by one. If there's a third person that's a two genetic distance from you, it could look like this. So that's what genetic distance means. See what I mean? Um, and But we're not going to worry about genetic distance because it's old technology. So the, y the, y the big Y700 isn't a stir test. It's a SNP test. A SNP test stands for single, nucle single nucleotide polymorphism. And it's just a fancy way of saying that the, see how it's, we all have an A here, but this person, there was a mutation and it became a T. So here's my, for example, let's pretend that these three are all exactly the same, okay? In every way. Here's my dad, my brother, my first cousin, my second cousin, my third cousin, Mark Finesis, right? Here's me. So remember when I said I'm a father of a of a family clade? I'm a I'm a mutation from my <laughs> ancestors. When I was born, right, in utero, when I'm being developed in my mother's womb, and the DNA is being and the cells are splitting and dividing, there a mutation happened. A code, maybe a coding error happened that didn't that that has never happened before in all of time in my family. And it happened in me. And it, it sounds rare, but it's not. It happens to every line on average, every third generation, right? So I was a lucky lotto winner. And so now I have my own family clade that differentiates me from my brothers. So this, the, so this, so the Y30, the Y, big Y700, this is the kind of test. Was, whereas the Y67, 111, this is the kind of test. Does that answer that question? I, I don't know. <laughs> well, so let me. It, how it much sure did. I, how, uh, much time do I have, how, how much time do I have left? Uh, well, we can do another couple of minutes or so. Okay, so I'm going to try to give some basic chemistry, and then we'll see how long this goes. All right, so really simple. This is like day one, week one of ninth grade biology, okay? Not not super scientific. So this is an oxygen atom, okay? This is an oxygen atom, and when we add, it, add two hydrogen atoms, we get water, water right? So we have... So this is a molecule. That's all a molecule. A molecule is simply a couple atoms that can combine to create a molecule, right? So here's a molecule. 
that we're going to add to the, the hydrogen and oxygen, we're going to add nitrogen and carbon to give us caffeine. So here's caffeine. It's a molecule, right? So these are molecules. These four things are molecules, but they're hard to say. So we call it G, A, T, and C. That's all. We, and they, they combine together in a, T always connects with A. They always connect in the same way. That's very easy, right? So see how, how G always connects with C and T always connects with A, always. And so if I only knew, if you only gave me this strand and I didn't have this strand, I could, I could fill in the blank and I could tell you what the other one is because it's always, it's 100% always. And this is how the body makes your cells, right? How does your body create new cells? It unzips your DNA and then it creates a copy. And, and when it does that, sometimes a mistake, and when it, think about making a photocopy, right? But sometimes, have you ever made a photocopy and there's a smudge on the, on the one page, like, right? Uh, an error will happen, a copy error, and that's a mutation. That's all mutation is. See that? Mm -hmm. So, so that's all. So all that that's all that means. And and because the, those mutations are passed from father to son, and because they're rare, but they happen enough. Again, once every third generation, they became breadcrumbs that you can follow. Does that make sense? And so, this is called the big, the big Y, the big Y uh, uh, tree. Have you guys heard of that? I've seen this before. So remember, yes. I showed, right? So I showed. So this is what this is. Is this is a pedigree chart of SNPing mutations? I guess is the best way I can explain it. This is this 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 um, turquoise box here is me, and this FT five fifty one seventy two is my the family clade that I was born into. But I have a mutation. But this is my dad, my first cousin, my second cousin, my third cousin, my uncle, my great uncle, right? And then this here is that man. Joseph Juan Guarberto Martin that settled, uh, that was born in Las Trampas, that settled in Llano Largo, that's him. So that's the key is that each one of these mutations is a per, is a human being, it's a person. But we, but this, the, the, the test doesn't know their names, but if you have genealogy, you know their names. I know the name of 5172. I know that person's name is my great grandfather. I know this person's name. It's Joseph Juan Guarberto Martin. And this FT3291, I actually am not sure because it could be Nicolas. Dis it's Nicola. I say it's Nicolas Spinoza, right? I say that this is Nicolas Spinoza, but it also could be his father or his grandfather. Because remember, this is the same problem Tom has: is that the mutation isn't unless you have genealogy records and you have this split out more. This this is called a block of equivalence. See how some blocks are smaller than that's what that that's what I do as a science. My job is to break these blocks into smaller blocks. That's what the rule of four is. So remember, we talked about, here's what the rule of one is. Oh, I've taken a test. And then remember, I mentioned to someone, hey, have a close relative take the test. Here's what that looks like. This used to look like this. A close relative took the test, and it named, instead of being a bunch of private, un, uh, un, private mutations, they become named. And in the, the son, this is actually a son of a father, actually had a mutation, just like I did. So it named them all, and then it gave and said, oh, there's one, uh, one that's private that belongs to the son that took that test. So this is the rule of one, this is the rule of two, and this is what the rule of three looks like, and this is what the rule of four looks like. See how it gets more and more detailed? Mm -hmm. And the blocks get smaller and smaller. So whether which one of these mutations, and oh, by the way, these mutations aren't in chronological order. It do, we don't know which one came before the other. The test can't tell you that. So in order for me to know which comes before the other, I need to split the block. When I first started testing, none of this existed. This was just five years ago. You know what my haplogroup was? QL663 was one big block. And what I've been doing over the last five years is I've been chipping away at this. And now I've designed, I've built, well, I've uncovered, because that was already existed, right? I've uncovered all of this because I've recruited almost every one of the person, people here that, that have tested. Eve, and these are, these are, remember, these are a Nicolas de Spinoza. Who are these people? These are people whose genealogy also goes to that same area of Mexico, but that predate, remember, uh, that predate um, Nicolas de Spinoza by hundreds of years. And I found them and I contacted them and said, take a test, take a test, please test. See what I mean? Um, and so these are all SNP mutations. 
And so does everybody have to take the Y700 test for the rule of two, rule of three, or can yes, they take absolutely. a lower test? You, you can't even play the game without the big Y. That's the key is that the Y37 is like a sampler. And, and the haplogroup you get isn't even a real haplogroup. It's a, it's a, it's not a confirmed haplogroup. It's a estimated haplogroup because the Y, the STIR tests can't provide haplogroups. Haplogroups only come from SNP testing. So it's really all the 99% of the action happens at the Y, big Y700 level. I mean, you can't even begin to play this game. All you can do is really kind of sit on the sidelines if you have anything other than the big Y700. If you're at a Y111, you can't take care. You can't uh, take advantage of any of the tools I've shown, like the, like the Discover More toolbox I showed you, or the Big White Block Tree, like I'm showing you here, or any of those ancient burials. Or, that all comes from the Big White 700. It's a huge expense. It's four hundred dollars, right? And then right. With, because of Father's Day, it's like three fifty or something like that. But it's expensive. But I have to tell you. Um. I go in the doghouse every time I spend a spend and buy one of these things. Um, you know, here's what I do, and I recommend it. So for I, I I'm not rich. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just a normal guy. So and I mentioned I'm taking. I'm doing all these. I'm not just doing my patrilineal line. I'm doing my all four of my grandparent my grandparents lines. Right. How how am I funding that? Well, what I'll do is I'll find other people and I'll say, hey, I'll I'll find a couple of people in the matches and say, hey. You provide 50 bucks, you provide 50 bucks, I'll throw in 100 because I'm the one driving this. And then I'll reach out to Miguel Torres at the New Mexico Genealogical Society and I'll say, hey, I've gathered $350 with the society, give us 50. I mean, I'll do it. And see what I'm saying? I'll, and usually, if like the, the Sanchez, the hypothesis of a Sanchez might actually be a descendant of, uh, of my Sanchez line might actually be this, which a lot of Lopez's, a lot of Lopez's and Sanchez's, they're the same paternal line. Um, my hypothesis is that, that this is the true ascent of the Archuleta line. That's a big deal, right? That's newsworthy. Yes. So, so I don't get to, I don't go to New Mexico Genealogical Society for money for anything. It has to be something like that. So guess what? Oh yeah, I have my handout. As a matter of fact, I'm waiting for the email from, from Miguel today to tell me how much, if anything, they're going to give me towards my test. But I'm I'm willing to hook up $300 I have another lady that's going to put in that's an Archuleta that's going to that who's from the Archuleta side that's going to put in a hundred, and and so that fully pays for it, right? But then I'm I'm asking New Mexico Genealogical Society, don't make me pay three hundred. This is big science. I'm doing it for all of us. Give give me something. I'll take anything, fifty bucks, you know, whatever, so that my three hundred will be two fifty. I'll take that plus okay. the, plus the fifty dollar sale for Father's Day. So this is how I fund it. And this is because most people don't have four I don't know about you. I don't have four hundred dollars sitting around with nothing to do. You know what I mean? Sure. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well that I think we're out of time. But well I um I I want to thank you. That it was absolutely fascinating. You you fascinating and you've left me with I don't I'm not I don't have a New Mexico connection. But I do have a Martinez grandfather who was born in Guanajuato. <laughs> and on my father's side, um, he was from Chihuahua. And uh, I've seen uh, ancestors from Lagos. Um, uh, but I have no way of doing a Y test. So it's very disappointing. So, well, let me address that really quick that keep looking because, like, um, you might have a fourth cousin out there. I know that's a little deep. That 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 actually is a male of that line. So that's where that's where autosomal DNA comes in, and that's where traditional genealogy comes in. It helps you. Find, it may not be a brother or a son. You might have to reach deep and find someone that's of that patrilineal line that's maybe a hundred or one hundred fifty years removed from you, but they're there. They're out there walking around. Well, I I do. Um, I found I never had a relative on my dad's side ever. But I found through the autosomal DNA, I have a second and third cousin. It's a, 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 a fellow with, and his mother. She's my second cousin. Mm -hmm. And I have i don't know. I've thought about asking him if they would download onto jedmatch.com. Jed mm -hmm. I don't know if that would help uh, to see if what the connection is. Because my father never knew his father. So I don't have a name. I have a mystery right. grandfather. Yeah. 
And right. so for you, the, the why DNA is something for the future. Right now you're you're working in the autosomal DNA. So DNA still has right. a place for you. It's just not this DNA, right? right. That's where autosomal DNA comes in. Uh, for people working anywhere within that five first five generations, autosomal DNA is amazing, right? And yeah. and and I recommend you reach out to an autosomal DNA expert to help you with your research so that someday you can then tap into this. Well, and on my mother's side, I do have a, a cousin, first cousin once removed directly descended from my grandfather. So um, I, maybe I could reach out to him and mm -hmm. see if he could do at least on that line. Yeah. But, and yeah. It, instances like that, you want to do a Y37 because you're you're exploring you don't know and you just right. want to see and that's where the why that's where the lower level Y DNA tests are helpful is that you're not sure and you don't want to make the huge investment quite yet you can make a like a Y37 is like what $99 or something like that yeah, um, yeah it's, so a, it's a lot easier than 400 right yeah <laughs> <laughs> well um thank you so much we've we're you're just getting all kinds of uh compliments here it was a fascinating uh presentation uh, again, want to thank Manuel for inviting you, and uh, I, we'd love to hear from you again sometime. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Father's Day weekend. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for the, all the fathers out there.